So, your sweet majesty, looking awry upon your lord's departure, find shapes of grief more than himself to wear, wear which, looked on as it is, is naught but shadows of what is not. Had I dared be as lyrical as I would like to be, I would, would have called this lecture on authority and culture, colon, what is not, or alternatively, the isness of not. The last quotation, um, or rather the third of the, the four, as I recall, I, I want to read to you, comes in Act 3 of Richard II, Scene 2, at line 160, in which, you remember, there's a reference to Memento Mori, for within the hollow crown that rounds the mortal temples of a king keeps death his court, and there the antic sits, scoffing his state and grinning his pomp. Finally, all I have to say is said by Dante in that marvelous passage in the Purgatory, Besogna saper legere, know how to read. My purpose here is to suggest to you a manual for the reading of an authority that is immutable, eternal, that is sacred. The structure of authority of which every culture is itself compound and uh, uh, which constitutes as culture a response in authority to the sacred order that is uh, given its name by authority. Um, it has the following constituents. Every structure of authority of which culture is compound has at its topmost and controlling level interdictory motifs, a not, a no. Whether it be primitive culture or the cultures of extremist modernity, that no, that complex or conjuries of no, continues however it is denied and resisted and in fact through denial and through resistance in the Freudian stipulation of denial and resistance. Indeed, culture is itself a strangely negational mode of recognizing and re-enacting sacred order that is the structure of authority. The introductory modes, the nots, the nos, are um, explicated in every culture, although explicated differently and in different stipulations. The argument between the cultural relativ uh, relativist and the absolutist seem to me beside the point. Um, the theologians of the past and sociologists are only, after all, insolent theologians. The theologians of the past knew how to distinguish between general and special revelation. Every culture is a special revelation, and in that revealing a concealing of general revelation. Both St. Thomas and Calvin understand that, and I have nothing original to tell you. I'm simply recycling, in a more awkward and recent language, knowledge, if not wisdom, widely disseminated in the past and repressed in the present. The introductory modes are evident 
in modern films. You don't have to turn to the Ten Commandments, and you don't have to turn to the Egyptian Book of the Dead, although you might find that salutary reading. Um, you may remember in the Egyptian Book of the Dead, um, there are 42 knots which every dead Egyptian must answer to when he enters the Hall of Judgment. You will find this all in E. Wallace Budge's um, grand um, edition of the Egyptian Book of the Dead called The Egyptian Book of the Dead. Uh, you will also find a lovely retelling of the Egyptian Book of the Dead <laughs> in the parables of the great Argentinian writer Borges. Um, in that um, Book of the Dead, every dead man, woman, and child confronts 42 gods, each the god of an interdict, a knot and must um, um, uh, react to the inquisition, the interrogation of the god who will say to them, have you stolen? Have you committed adultery? Have you been insolent? Have you been, imagine this among the academic um, um, Egyptians, have you been verbose? Uh, <laughs> And in each case, the answer must be, no, my God, I have not. If it is not, then the executive officer of all the gods, a, a human eater, um, liberally translated by Budge, an eater of humans comes along, and you suffer a second death. And in, in that second death, your first death is judged. By the way, you will find a stunning and far more intellectually sophisticated uh, theory of the second death in two places in the canon of Western theoretical literature, understanding theory in one of its uh, adequate stipulations as a vision of the highest. You'll find it in Augustine's City of God, in a chapter on the second death, which, as Augustine rightly understood, precedes the first death because it is the death of the soul. It is soullessness, which is, I think, what the Egyptian theorists were after in the death of in the second death uh, caused by the man-eater of those who have transgressed or lied about their transgressions either. Um, in the doctrine of the second death in, uh, in Augustine, in the city of God, you actually suffer this second death before the first. The first death is the death of the body. The second death is the death of the soul. And that death of the soul, that is, that in the Augustinian stipulation, that separation from God and the commandments of God can occur while the first death has not yet occurred. You will find, of course, the most exquisite rendering of this in fiction in Tolstoy's The Death of Ivan Ilyich which is why in that magnificent novella, at the moment of his death, Ivan Ilyich conquers his second death and says, death is no more. And then he dies, the first death, you may recall. A paradox some of my students have trouble believing because, of course, they are in their second death. Um, <laughs> Uh, being Marxist, most of them. <laughs> Every society has 
so far as it is vital, a doctrine which carries enormous capacities for life and death in which the knots, the interdicts, a phrase, of course, you will recall Durkheim uses in the elementary forms of religious life in the theoretical sections uh, with supreme facility and uh, with a great importance for our disciplines, all those cognates of sociology. Um, every vital culture has within it um, a, a doctrine which carries with it the possibility of punitive sanctions when the supreme knots are, I must use now the, uh, another key word in the theory of, of eternal and immutable authority I am here proposing, when those knots are transgressed. That is, when what is not is as simply in the Judaic culture thou shalt not and then the stipulation when that transgression occurs something of ultimate seriousness of, uh, of complete consequentiality must take place a judgment becomes objectively present it is not a question of one's subjective response. This eternal structure of authority, this sacred order, is the supreme reality to which every culture is itself a varying response. The variety of response, of course, is itself a function of uh, various conditions which are the delightful subject of historians, poets, and every man as he goes through his changeable life. Now, the, the knots uh, um, exist in every culture always with a condition that I have come to call, borrowing the term both from canon law, where it appears quite heavily, and indeed from the language of medicine, remission. Yeah. Canon law, of course, borrows it from the great Christian doctrine of the remission of sins, but every structure of authority has not only its controlling introductory level what is forbidden what is not to be done a remissive level that is what is not to be done yet done there are glorious elaborations marvelous intellectual structures of remissive motifs Jesuit probabilism is such an elaborate uh, set of remissive motifs. Um, it is one sign of what is happening in modernity to test Catholicism for how often canon law is now taught. For example, I could not find a place in the great Roman Catholic city of Philadelphia with its many Catholic colleges and seminaries in which one of my PhD candidates working on certain problems for his dissertation could take a course in canon law. Jesuit probabilism uh, using canon law may be summarized, as you know better than I, I'm sure, those of you who have had uh, any uh, preparation in Roman Catholic uh, uh, theology and natural law, um, uh, Jesuit probabilism is a, um, a doctrine in which you may do something if you can cite an authority for the doing of that something which would otherwise not be done. And it is therefore, in the straightforward sense of the word, 
probabilist doctrine is, I say, therefore, in the straightforward sense of the word, casuistical. Casuistry is remissive. It finds excusing reasons for doing what is otherwise not to be done. I'll give you a simple and famous example of, of um, Roman Catholic probabilism or remissive uh, uh, doctrine in action. You may remember the famous crash in the Andes in which the survivors uh, in complete snow and um, a starving ate their dead um, uh, companions in that flight. Uh, it, it, a number of those who survived were uh, members of the Roman Catholic uh, faith and the question arose after they were found what their spiritual condition was and it was decided in time by an elaborate casuistry which I need not detail here the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, that they were justified in eating uh, the uh, flesh of their dead companions and this was officially stated after you might say an elaborate casuistical investigation of the circumstances another vast literature of remissive elaboration which always supports the introductory mode you understand that the that the canon lawyers who decided that they were excusing reasons for eating the limbs of their dead companions, uh, thought they were supporting the natural law and supporting the, the uh, interdictory motifs in, uh, uh, embodied in the Roman Catholic faith. It is characteristic of remissive motifs that they subserve, not subvert, the interdictory motifs. They are what is not done, done only under excusing and extraordinary circumstances obvious in the Andes case. Another vast literature is the post-biblical literature of the Jews. The Midrash, the Mishnah, the entire Talmudic literature is a vast body of very carefully and uh, uh, beautifully argued cases, as in the English common law, indeed, uh, except the, the uh, logic often grows so complicated um, that the Talmudists themselves are puzzled about what the rabbis meant. But, but uh, we can thus speak sociologically in many cultures, including primitive cultures, at one level of intellectual elaboration and rationalization or another of interdictory remissive elites that are in fact the teachers or pastoral guides of that entire society. Uh, every culture appears to have, however nascently or however exhaustedly, such an interdictory remissive elite. Um, the, the third level of every structure of authority of which culture is compounded is the transgressive. The transgressive is always the inversion of the interdictory, the not inverted into the must. And we now have doctrines, um, there's a vast uh, expressive or symptomatic literature of this kind which says thou must commit adultery thou must swap wives thou shalt not remain celibate usually transgressive motifs are specific to a, an interdictory remissive motif I would suggest to you that a sociological history of culture must study the expansion and contraction of remissive motifs in their relation to interdictory motifs. 
am. I would suggest to you that there are also transgressive elites. Uh, uh, and those transgressive elites are never traditionalist, are never conservative. Because conservative elites, like the rabbinate, like the priesthood, uh, um, have as their purpose the uh, attempt at a stabilization very difficult to achieve and never achieved, only proximately so, of the introductory remissive modes. As one great um, uh, teacher of the 19th century, himself well aware, um, as one can see in his history of Christian doctrine, of the subtle interplays, John Henry Cardinal Newman put it, there is no rule, meaning interdict, on earth without its exceptions. There is no rule on earth without its exceptions. That is a perfect statement of the, sinu of, of the sinuous mind of a, of a supremely intelligent member of an introductory remissive elite. Um, and of, of course uh, we find this both in the old, uh, this kind of sinuous wisdom um, in a vast array of cultural expressions. Now, um, I must hurry on. I do want to give us, uh, take us away from uh, the literature of the, of the literati and the, uh, the intellectuals to uh, uh, what is available to the culture nowadays to give you some sense of the eternal uh, character of authority. Because authority cannot decline. It cannot disappear. It is sacred, that is, eternal, ineliminable. It can only shift between these modalities that I have labeled uh, introductory, remissive, and transgressive. So that you can have regimes that are authoritative in one way, for example, uh, uh, the, a, a particular theocracy, uh, a particular subculture, say Methodist culture, which uh, is, uh, bans smoking, drinking, dancing, or whatever you have, or the, um, the culture of the, of the ghetto for millennia in the Jewish diaspora, you, uh, that is a, a form of, uh, of, its, of authority, of response to sacred order. You can al also have transgressive authority. In my reading, with which I think that superb um, sociologist um, and Michael Pogliani w would have agreed, in my reading, Nazism and fascism are, in fact, anti-conservative, radical, transgressive movements, as is Stalinism, Leninist Stalinism. In fact, Marxist theory, from the great Dr. Marx on, seems to me to be powerfully transgressive, and to celebrate itself as transgressive authority. In fact, it celebrates the bourgeois, you may remember in the manifesto, as the great destroyer of sacred order, on which, when it says the bourgeois profanes everything sacred or holy, um, Heiliger's, I think, uh, Marxist construction, the bourgeoisie in the Marxist theory is the, the great revolutionary class. But what does it mean to be revolutionary? In the Marxist stipulation, um, using the word stipulation from its Latin root stipes or hedging or narrowing or delimitation, in the Marxist stipulation, the bourgeoisie is essentially revolutionary because it is transgressive, because it will not stop at anything. There is nothing that is not to be done. 
So of course the vast travesty, as Weber recognized, on what the Protestant ethos, that is the spirit of capitalism, was all about, and he tried desperately to respond to the Marxist um, reification of the transgressivity of the bourgeois in the Protestant ethic and the spirit of capitalism, which is a brilliant, if far from, I think, complete answer to Marxism, yet it is a partial answer, one he didn't give well enough, I think, in part, because he didn't dig deeply enough into the particular uh, cultural expressions of the sacred order of Protestant spirituality. If he had read um, Benjamin Franklin more carefully, and in a complete edition, which he didn't, he didn't have a complete edition available, in fact, he would have found 13 introductory uh, propositions stated as a code in Franklin's autobiography. Thou shalt not be unpunctual. Thou shalt not, of course, all the, all the obvious inherited great moral shalt nots. Thou shalt not use venery except for health and procreation, um, says Franklin. Um, uh, 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 the received tradition within his culture. Um, fascism and Marxism are closely allied as transgressive movements that both accept a Marxist reading of bourgeois culture as itself transgressive. That is, as a culture that is the first to establish the fact in social life that there is nothing sacred. Uh, it is a great issue, uh, but one on which, uh, on the whole, uh, Marxist symbolism has won. The self-hatred of the bourgeoisie, uh, their own assumption that they find nothing sacred is a very widespread and is one of the keys to uh, what is sometimes called the decline of the West. Now to turn for a moment from these grand and, and, and high-flown themes to some other expressions of the structure of authority or the nature of sacred order of which all cultures are historical expressions and to which uh, uh, that is and they are also uh, responses to sacred on which uh, on the whole uh, Marxist symbolism has won the self-hatred of the bourgeoisie uh, their own assumption that they find nothing sacred is a very widespread and is one of the keys to uh, what is sometimes called the decline of the West. Now to turn for a moment from these grand and, and, and high-flown themes to some other expressions of the structure of authority or the nature of sacred order of which all cultures are historical expressions and to which, uh, uh, that is, and they are also uh, responses to sacred order, that is, the structure of authority. You may remember, uh, have you seen some of you, that great American film Chinatown? done by Roman Polanski. In the last scene of that great film, uh, uh, made by a wildly transgressive figure, Roman Polanski has been prosecuted for a number of sexual offenses, um, for um, um, <coughs> uh, taking over sexually and exploiting across the continent. Um, between states and among states, um, a 14-year-old girl. Uh, uh, you may remember he played the, the uh, little knife-wielding thug who slits 
Jake Gittes' nose at one point. You remember that? That's Polanski playing himself. Um, but at the end of that film, the private eye, the essentially decent, if remissive figure, who is blind, literally blind, almost throughout the film to what is going on in the film. Jake Gittes, private eye, straight out of Chandler, and the others of the of, of uh, the detective literature. Jake Giddis at the end when um, uh, John Houston uh, embraces his granddaughter daughter. He is her grandfather father, having had incestuous relations with the now dead mother killed by the uh, stupid and ignorant police, you may remember, in Chinatown in Los Angeles. I visited the street on which this uh, shot was made. Um, had a delightful meal there. <laughs> Give you the address of the restaurant if you want it. Um, the, uh, Jake Giddis mumbles the key phrase in that film which links it to Dostoevsky, to Crime and Punishment, and especially to the Brothers Karamazov, and especially uh, to the Devils, to the great canon of, uh, of Dostoevsky's work, when he mumbles. It's very hard to hear. It's the master piece of nuance. He mumbles to himself as the, the incestuous daughter of Faye Dunaway is slumped on the horn, Underneath the horn, Jake mumbles, everything is possible. And that's how the film ends. The, in, the, the father-grandfather embracing his daughter-granddaughter. You may remember a film in a very different mode, just to be sure that I, I am... I want, I'm desperate to be concrete about this, not to leave you with, with abstractions that you can walk straight through without affect. Uh, I think teaching, I think mind and passion are inseparable. That's what I call normative sociology. <laughs> uh, do you remember Renoir's Rules of the Game? Marvelous film. The erotic swirl of relations, finally the lovely lady of that film. I can't spend very much more time at this. I only have till 7 o'clock. There will be no questions, of course. Uh, uh, the, the, uh, uh, this is an entirely intradictory performance. The, um, but it can't be because it is a performance, and all performances have a very strong remissive element. Um, we are all engaged in what I call display performances here during this, this symposium. Um, God help us. The, uh, but you may remember at the climax, I say climax is a pun, of that film, um, the woman who is the erotic centerpiece, who is really quite innocent, expresses her love for five different men all with equal sincerity. She's so confused by the erotic world um, of justified desire and of justified or rationalized response to desire. And one of those who love her, to whom she responds with love, the romantic airman in the film, you may remember, is shot by a jealous um, 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 a gamekeeper, jealous not of the aristocratic lady, but of his own wife in a comic subplot, in the classical tradition of comic subplots of the underlings in that society, the house servants, the bottoms of that world, if you will. Um, and um, um, this ass uh, shoots, shoots the romantic... Uh, Lin French Lindbergh uh, figure in the film, and, uh, and uh, at the end, the chorus 
played by the director himself. A marvelous touch. Renoir himself, of course, is one of those who loves the noble erotic lady. And at a certain point he says, he mumbles, uh, nothing is impossible. And uh, in, a, in another... Um, um, in another quotation less familiar perhaps not from the film but from a very sinister and um, telling reality a series of interviews Hermann Roshni mayor of Danzig was he not put? Uh, Hermann Roshni in his mem uh, memoir of his conversations with Hitler translated as the voice of destruction uh, asking Hitler about his strategy says I have only one strategic principle. Only the impossible is successful. Only the impossible is successful. There is the voice of a true transgressive, a genius of transgression. And there will come a time, I assure you, that if this powerfully remissive culture, in a way John Carroll has traced uh, brilliantly in one of his books, if this remissive culture continues in its present way, it won't be only the punk rockers who will dress in swastikas and so forth. Uh, just as the admiration for Stalin and for the party is very widespread among uh, the remissive elites of the West. However, however concealed that admiration may now be. In my youth, it was quite open. The old German phrase, alles besser unter der Kaiser, I remember in my student days at the University of Chicago, my Marxist friends told me that Soviet child wearing, Soviet everything, was simply superior to everything in capitalist society. Uh, the sun never sets on insolence. And uh, however, as, as Plato has his, um, his Socrates figure say to Philebus in that very great dialogue, um, the goddess of limits, my dear Philebus, uh, um, denies and resists the approach or the approaches of insolence. The characteristic movement of modernity has been an expansion of the remissions, uh, approaches of insolence toward their superordinate interdictory stipulations. And therefore, the opening up of the conditions for the growth of transgressive behavior in a particular culture that is in our own as I put it elsewhere, after the hippies come the thugs. After the thugs come the killers. That is the history of the remissive space called Hate Ashbury, has Asbury in San Francisco, where flower power originated. And when I said that in a lecture at the Jesuit University of San Francisco, half the Marxist fathers fell off their chairs. The other half hissed. Um, now, when this structure is operating well, um, in the Freudian language and in orthodox Freudian theory, from which I've learned an enormous amount, although I'm not a Freudian, I simply think Freud is the greatest social theorist of the 20th century and must be worked through and reused, if you will, with the garbage eliminated, much of the garbage taught by psychoanalysts. The, um, the, in the Freudian mode, these structures of inhibition, which constitute culture, as the introductory remissive mode is clearly a modality of inhibition. Um, he thought of chiefly in a, a, a couple of conceptualizations, or three really, that uh, you may recall, suppression, unterdrückung, 
um, uh, the gift, renunciation, and finally that most slippery and most popular of all uh, Freudian um, uh, slipperinesses, sublimation. I, for one, think there ain't no such animal as sublimation. That is, in the Freudian theory, sublimation is itself a transformation of the instinctual unconscious, a concept without which I think we cannot have a sociology of culture, that is, the concept of the unconscious, which would have been better translated if the, if the polite Englishman who did most of the translations had used a far simpler and more direct uh, a English expression of the German. In Freud, the word is unbewusst, literally unknown. The unconscious is the unknown and the unknowable. So, of course, there are two unconsciousnesses in this great theory of the 20th century, which you can read back as well as forward. And that one is the instinctual unconscious, which, as the Marxist uh, friends of my youth would say, not accidentally, comrades, has no no. There is no no in the unconscious. The unconscious takes everything, responds to everything, denies nothing. Um, this is the, this is Freud's pseudo-neutralist translation of the transgressive in sacred order, that is, in the structure of authority. The, uh, the instinctual unconscious which knows no no and will brook no no. Freud, however, was so magnificent a theoretical imagination that he wasn't content with the instinctual unconscious. In fact, the instinctual unconscious is not the dynamic unconscious. It's not the unconscious with which we really have to grapple in the most signifying way. The really significant second institution of the unconscious, which is by far the more powerful and directive part of the human mind, far more powerful and directive than consciousness, um, then knowing or knowledge is unknowing. The second and more powerful institution is that unconscious created by repression. As early as 1896, Freud wrote to his then confidant, the repository of all of his wildest and most productive in, um, world intuition, Sleep. Um, uh, Freud wrote to Sleep, repression is my chief problem. That was 1896, the year of his father's death and the year of his revelation, the year in which he found his mission, the year in which the true writing of his masterwork, the interpretation of dreams, really began. By the way, Freud was so certain of the, of the millennial importance of that work, which was read by a handful of people when it was published in 1900, that he instructed his publisher, Deutiger, to print the letters 1900, 1900 on the title page, that was published in 1899. And Deutiger was totally baffled, but this was Freud's certainty, arrived through terrible agony of years, and his own kind of nervous breakdown, that this would be a millennial work, as indeed I think it is proved to be. At any rate, the dynamic unconscious is the unconscious created by repression. And Freud struggled through a very long theoretical life to understand repression. The one thing we know about repression is if something is repressed, you can't know it. It only reemerges indirectly, awry. 
in every culture the introductory motifs and their remissions are most powerfully and deeply installed through the repressive mode. Repression is never to be abolished. Freud understood that. And the modern movement to abolish repression in choices of lifestyle and all that is clearly transgressive. It is an act of insolence, of will, that Nietzsche in his wildest dreams of the will to power never imagined. Because in Nietzsche, of course, the repressive motif remains, even the will to power is itself an organizing vitality of super and subordination that is, is, is clear in the first 15 chapters of the birth of tragedy as it can be and at, in the posthumous work the will to power is remains so um, you know, modernity has gone far beyond Nietzschean nihilism on this matter Freud thought repression could never be abolished whether that theoretical argument uh, interests us or not I suggest to you that the instrument for the installation of a of sacred order in in any vital culture is repression and must be taught indirectly through trivia not through grand abstractions so that even the creedal statements of thou shalt not commandments, dogmas, orthodoxies are not the key. What is the key is the unrecognized repressions that carry the interdictory remissive motifs and make it impossible, impossible even to dream, undisguised, unconcealed, the transgression of these interdictory remissive motifs. That's the key to the interpretation of dreams. Even asleep, when you can't possibly murder, when you can't possibly commit adultery, when you can't possibly steal, even adultery, even stealing, at a certain point, if the transgressions grow direct enough in the, in the repressed unconscious, you will wake says Freud. Uh, a further point very necessary here is we all dream in images. We all literally see what we're doing in our dreams and what others are doing. And uh, um, just a word of clinical advice to you, if you don't dream in images, you're in serious trouble. Um, since sociologists can't possibly dream in images, they have almost no imagery in their sociological language. They are in a severe psychopathological condition. Uh, and uh, we must wake them up and do something about it. Um, so rep the repressive mode, that is the mode of rendering the interdictory remissive stipulations that constitute a particular and historical culture which are always in delicate balances, you understand. You mustn't have an image of a wall or a barrier. Um, I tried to explain this to a Melbourneian lady at dinner the other night, at a dinner party, and, I, and she said I ought to go up to see she knew I'd written something on Freudian theory, and, uh, um, and uh, I think she'd read a review of something, of uh, being a cultivated lady, and um, um, she said something about uh, going up to see the Great Barrier Reef, and I said, imitating the late Dr. Johnson, but Madam, I am the Barrier Reef. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Every
everyone except the lady laughed. Um, um, now the the, um, the the point is that the repressive mode is not a great barrier reef. I don't. Uh, it is not a barrier in the sense of keeping out what is repressed completely. What is repressed enters indirectly, as Bushy says to the queen, a lie. And it is Freud's genius, and the genius of others, for example, Henry James is very great genius, to, as narrator, to have you look and listen, a lie to actors for example, in The Golden Bowl, quite self-consciously, one of the most brilliant theoretical pieces in Western literature is the introduction to The Golden Bowl by H. James, in which, typically, of James at his greatest in the late novels, what you have is a series of conversations and gestures, and James then enormously elaborating in a way Freud would have admired greatly had he read James. Alas, he didn't go, though he read Shakespeare, from whom he learned a great deal indeed. Um, the Oedipus Complex should have been titled the Hamlet Complex, without a doubt, um, as he himself all but admits. Um, in James, the characters speak and act, but what, they, what the latent meaning, what the cultural meaning is, what the true spiritual condition of what they're saying and acting depends on James's unfolding of what is complicit in what they're saying and acting. That reality is there. That is, it is not an interpretation. It is rather an unfolding of what the characters themselves don't know, and yet know because they're really saying what they're incapable of saying without the ubiquitous narrator, James himself. That's also a key to Conrad and to the Conradian technique. Now, James, I think, the greater technician of, um, uh, in this matter. I think another, another great artist of indirection is Lawrence Stern. I'm a devoted champion. Uh, uh, and if you want to see culture in action, you ought to read. Um, um, Tristan Shandy, gentlemen, um, um, the life and opinions of. Now, I must hurry on. I'm, I want to emphasize before I begin to show you what uh, the structure of authority, which is culture, uh, looks like so that you can actually see its existence. I must emphasize uh, again uh, for fear of your accepting a very widespread um, popular and academic misunderstanding of repression that repression is like a wall or a fortress and it keeps something out. No, Freud had a very uh, a different and dynamic conception of repression. Repression is a very dynamic thing. It is, uh, it's not a thing, but it is, it is the movement through the attachment from one object of fear of affect and thought to another of the repressive motif itself, always deriving from the energies of the interdictory motif. And repression is therefore always delicately balanced. It is, in Freud's own language, a question of more or less, very delicately balanced. And what appears, disappears, attaches itself to something unlikely. The nearest um, analog in the theoretical literature you'll find of the true Freudian conception of repression is in Tolstoy's marvelous a work on, on, the, on aesthetics called What is Art? Because he finally says, art is a question of more or less, of delicate balancing, although he doesn't quite say of what. But to what purpose is clear. 
the purpose of art in the Tolstoyan mode is obedience. And the purpose of repression is an obedience in which you can have your cake, but only in some substitutive or surrogate form. That's as near as Freud ever came to a really powerful conceptualization of sublimation. Instead of sublimation, I suggest that uh, we must reconsider that genteel progressivist notion of sublimation uh, because uh, uh, sublimation would, in effect, wipe out the transgressive in the structure of authority, a very optimistic uh, scientific notion of the 19th and late 18th century. Uh, the alternative to sublimation is obedience. Um, obedience to the right and established order itself delicately balanced in introductory, remissive, and, and transgressive um, stipulations of a, 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 a right and established order of introductory, remissive, and transgressive stipulations that constitute the response that is culture to that structure of authority. Culture is nothing but that. It is the working out of these delicate balances, and it must operate unconsciously. It must be unknown to the actors to be effective. Therefore, the whole Weberian theory of rationalization, if it means the um, ubiquity um, of consciousness, uh, by contrast to unconsciousness, is a theory of the end of culture. And I think there are points at which Weber has that apocalyptic vision. Except it's impossible, for reasons I've tried to make clear. Um, now, I want to begin to show you if I've done a, a reasonably adequate job of of the basic uh, um, uh, theory of culture, uh, including the sociology of culture, I want to begin to show you culture in artifact. I want you to be able to read it with me, uh, at least in the way I think it, it can be read. First, I want to mention to you a perfect piece of graffiti expressing the entire remissive movement of modernity. I don't want to refer here to Joyce, whom I consider a very great remissive artist. Um, I don't want to here consider the various therapeutic movements, Esselin or any of that. I just want to tell you about a huge piece of graffiti on the Ponte Vecchio in Florence. It said in letters as high as this room, e vietato vietare. E vietato vietare. It is forbidden to forbid. That is the expansion of the remission in a way that gives the transgressions a clear field. Now to turn to some images that are by no means conscious, but highly stipulated of the structure of authority that is culture at its height in the tradition of Western iconography, which is the only tradition I know. To really get inside Chinese iconography or the structure of authority in Chinese culture, you would really have to live through that culture. And so all these examples come from what is realistically and rightly called the West. In all its complexities, it has a definite, in the Latin sense, stipulated structure of authority, a highly specific although variegated 
um, um, uh, culture. Here we have uh, the great um, Holbein, um, the Youngers, um, the Ambassadors. Uh, many of you have undoubtedly seen this in the National Gallery in London. Uh, here we have a prince of the state. Here we have a prince of the church. Here we have the instruments of science. Here we have the arts, literature. You see this magnificent rug. Everything of high culture is present. But where in this high culture is the introductory motif? Well, of course, there's a placard, as you know, as you approach the ambassadors in the National Gallery in London. And the placard says, this is an anamorphic picture. And if you stand, as Bushy says to the Queen in Richard II, awry, you will see disguised, concealed, distorted the introductory revealing itself because every revelation is a concealment and all great cultures derive from the energy of revelation concealed. Culture is revelation concealed and it is one of my life tasks to reinstate an understanding and obedience to revelation. I was delighted to hear the number of times that Professor Heller stand, as Bushy says to the Queen in Richard II, a lie. You will see disguised, concealed, distorted, the introductory revealing itself, because every revelation is a concealment, and all great cultures derived from the energy of revelation concealed. Culture is revelation concealed. And it is one of my life tasks to reinstate an understanding and obedience to revelation. <clears throat> I was delighted to hear the number of times that Professor Heller used the word revelatory and revelation in her own lecture. I don't think that was completely unconscious. Uh, this image is uh, the interdict of interdicts in every culture. It is, of course, an enormous skull in the foreground. Do you see it? Uh, impossible to see directly. It can only be seen by indirection, awry. It is a perfect image of repression. It is quite clear that these proud magnificos of the church and of the state, by the way, both known figures, uh, men of immense culture in their time, of uh, great accomplishment, at the very height of their culture, have before them the truly dominating element in the foreground, death, the interdict of interdicts. Um, uh, but of course, concealed, awry, distorted, in the true manner of the repressive mode. Nothing else here is so distorted. And Holbein, using a tradition that was already established, uh, was giving us a, a true image of what culture must be. Now, how do I do this? Let me see. The, this gadget is so advanced. Did, no, nothing happened. Uh, no. Uh, oh, dear. I'm way, way, way off. I have no idea what to do now. All right, we'll start here. Uh, but, uh, I want to stay with this sequence. What do I do? Oh, I see. That, that probably will solve my problem. Um, uh, no, that's not right. 
that's the one I want. Now, how does that get there? <laughs> now, for a focus. Uh, I don't know whether this is seeable. This is Jasper Johns' uh, 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 painting and collage. I saw it at the Whitney a couple of three years ago in a great Jasper Johns show. There's the American artist Jasper Johns, as you know. Uh, 1961 is when he did it. And it has a wire hanging down this uh, brilliantly ambiguous uh, canvas. And at the end, you see a no. And then behind the no is another no. And uh, again, a wonderful and I think thoroughly unconscious image of repression. I asked Johns once what he thought he was doing. And he said, well, I think I know, but I don't know. And that's a, that's a complete, a wonderful statement of the way most of us are at our best as well as at our worst. Now, does this mean no to no, or does it mean more emphatically no, no? Now, there was a school led by an admirable man called Roger Fry that would have ignored the content, the thematic cultural content of this and every other painting completely and abstract completely to what he called significant form. I will show you something that embarrassed Fry greatly if there is time, a picture of an Olympia figure uh, that is a figure of total sensuality th in which Fry, in this great work on Cezanne, studiously ignores the subject and talks only about color masses and so forth. The doctrine of significant form is itself a repression of what it is that, uh, that this, these Bloomsbury people were looking at, but that's for the future. Now let me see if I can possibly get the next one on. Um, here is another image of the introductory. Uh, we see it twice. Once in a Vanitas image, the mirror, this is, of course, the Repentant Magdalene by De La Tour in the National Gallery in Washington, and she is touching, it's, uh, she is touching the very sources of her repentance. That is the understanding of the limit of limits, of the no of no's, the interdict of interdict, the skull. That's what in, in our culture the skull has meant. Um, oh dear. Um, I'm sorry to be so feckless. I'm almost as feckless as the people running my hotel, but I can't seem to understand the principles here. Um, oh dear. John, do you have any idea of what this? I think you have to watch for a couple of seconds to turn the ball. No, it's not that sort. Sorry. Do you want to take that forward? Why don't you do it, and I'll I'll. Uh, uh, you tell me when you want me to. Right, to right. <laughs> That'll be. I can't really subject you to my learning how to cope with this thing. <laughs> there is, of course, the total interdict, nothing. <laughs> well, we've had no, the repentant Magdalene. This is Turner's great, the son of Venice going out to sea, and it's a death picture. Uh, I shan't take time to give you Turner's own reading of it, except to remind you that uh, the last memorable words he spoke according to his first biography, Thornbury, and, and, and uh, according to the legends of his death, uh, were the son is God. And Turner was a great theorist, and those of us in the social sciences must learn to use our eyes. Um, uh, if we're to understand the reality around us. The next slide, please. 
an image of death. Here is, of course, the first of the great Vanitas um, pictures. It's by de Keen, um, the Vanitas picture in the uh, Metropolitan in New York, uh, about 1603. Here we have beauty. Here we have coins and uh, empress and emperor and all of that. But here is the introductory image based on the great biblical text all flesh is grass. Um, and so we have in the whole tradition of Vanitas um, imagery um, the introductory motif played out. You must ask yourself where in modern imagery is the introductory motif played out uh, so, so definitely and so magnificently. Next slide, please. Here is a a splendid, playful, erotic image of, uh, of the dynamics of repression. This is Veronese in the National Gallery in London, and he called it unfaithfulness. One hand doesn't allow the other hand to know what it is doing. She is offering her affections to two men at the same time. These are, of course, Putti, uh, Eros figures, and it is a uh, it is characteristic of the repressions that um, um, the repressive motif allows um, a certain unfaithfulness. By the way, in Freud, un, as in unbewusst, um, was a sure prefix of repression. He said, whenever you see the prefix un, you are trenching on repression. Now the way the repressions work are by negation. The intellectual expression of repression is negation and denial. In, in one of Freud's most amusing passages in, in one of his uh, papers, around 1915, he uh, tells the archetypal a Freudian joke against Freudianism. The analyst says to the, um, um, to the uh, patient, ah, it uh, what are you thinking of? And the patient answers, I'm not thinking of my mother. And of course the analyst then says, aha, he is thinking of his mother. Because the only way that thought can enter consciousness is negationally. In modernity, it is characteristic of modernity, in great artists and thinkers as different as Virginia Woolf and Ludwig Wittgenstein, not to mention Joyce, a particular favorite enemy of mine, that, uh, who treats all high culture and, and, and uh, the life of the spirit as eruditional garbage for his art, um, uh, picked up everything and literally wants you to read his work as our predecessors read the Bible. Um, he said so explicitly. At any rate, those are works of negation. They only admit negationally, by denial, what they cannot recognize otherwise. And I think the entire literature of modernity has to be reread in that way as a literature of negation in the Freudian um, a sense of negation. Uh, now, um, uh, uh, I think you will find this beautifully done in Virginia Woolf's The Waves, if I can suggest one uh, supremely negational um, um, prose poem to you uh, in English. Uh, uh, this is very important, by the way, in Kafka, for example, in uh, the uh, Straf colony, uh, in which you have the officer of sacred order, the last sacred order on earth, which appears to the explorer a remissive intellectual, um, an, an, an anthropologist of sort, a tourist of cultures, which appears to the explorer as a punishment colony. Uh, 
Uh, it's a brilliant work of negation, um, and I'm now giving you the nubbin of a chapter from a work tentatively titled The Return of the Sacred, um, which is the third and concluding volume of a trilogy I've been at along uh, with work. Um, uh, the first two volumes were mentioned by John Carroll. This is, this is Veronese's compliment to unfaithfulness, which is not best understood, as uh, Veronese intuited brilliantly. He called this picture not faithfulness, but respect. Stipulated in the sexual situation, she is dreaming. She is in the most accessible condition to a transgressive act, that is, to the, to, the, to the assault of Mars. And in fact, this terrible figure of Western iconography, Eros or Cupid, is a very cruel figure, really, um, is, is uh, pointing out to him what's possible. And she is in the most receptive condition. But he won't. That is what faithfulness means. It means not doing what is really in the cards. There's a marvelous passage in um, Maimonides' Guide to per the Perplexed on what a sin really is. It's a very specific case. In Maimonides, uh, in this instance, a, a um, uh, Jew goes to a foreign land and he meets a Jewess, uh, he meets a non-Jewess who solicits him. And um, uh, the, the key to Maimonides' lesson is that although it is not formally in what is the equivalent of canon law among the Jews at that time, not formally a disobedience to have intercourse with the non-Jewess in the foreign land. That's how explicit the casuistry is in that literature. He doesn't. And Maimonides says, that is true observance when you go beyond the law. Um, my wife, who is a Scot by origin, how can you be more Scottish than to be named uh, Alison Douglas Knox? always leaves notes on the windshield when she parks illegally, saying, Officer, I'm sorry I had to park illegally. Please give me a traffic ticket. Um, <laughs> which drives a remissive post-Jew like myself up the wall, of course. Uh, but she tells me she's an officer of the court, straight out of Kafka. Uh, let's go on to the next. Here is a superb image of repression, one of the most powerful and, and exemplary uh, 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 um, images of Western culture, that is, of the structure of authority. Remember, that's what culture is, a specific response. You'll have to find others. I'm trying to give you marvelously crystallized and beautiful responses. This is Velasquez. La menina, las Meninas, where is the object, the focal point of the picture? Well, to be very brief, here is Velasquez himself as a self-portrait, here is the Infanta, here is the dwarf, here is the dog, and there is a nobleman going out, there are definite scenes on the wall, pictures within pictures, beautiful light in the foreground to distract your eye, but the real center of the picture can only be seen indirectly because it's out there. The king and queen are being painted on this easel, this enormous easel, and you see them reflected here. That's the true subject of the picture. So that in Western art, I don't know what Velasquez had in mind, but this is objectively and incontrovertibly an image of the repressive mode. Because the true subject is hidden except by reflection or indirection. That's how the repressive mode always works. 
you see the subject is reflected in the mirror. The king and queen are out there where you are, which carries, of course, a double irony. Because not only the king and queen, but you become the true subject of the picture in your perceptions of what is only perceivable indirectly, by indirection, as the great James said, as the key to the readings of his novels. Uh, if only sociologists would be more artful, more deceitful, instead of merely dishonest, it would be very helpful. <laughs> Let's go on to the next. This is Picasso, one of his variations and parodies of Las Meninas. He did about 30. They're in Barcelona, and here you have you see the figure going through the door. It's an even more highly repressive uh, version than the Las uh, uh, Picasso was so transgressive that he couldn't bear the readable transgress uh, the, the readable repressive mode of Las Maninas, so he complicated it unutterably. So it's much harder to read, but you can see the elements of it, can't you? Where is, uh, 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 can you see immediately the king and queen? Here's the infanta, obviously. There's a dwarf, and there's a dog right here. But where, you say, where is the mirror with the king and queen? Can you tell? Well, let's go on to the next. <laughs> it's way back here, and it's empty. Empty. The real subject in Picasso who is a truly uh, a trans, a transgressive genius, eliminated the true subject of the work. Uh, we're, uh, let's go on to the next. This is again uh, a Velasquez, uh, 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 Jesus in the house of Mary and uh, Martha and Mary. And you remember the passage in the Gospels on this matter. The true subject of the picture is not Martha and Mary, but uh, sitting at the feet of Jesus in a picture within a picture. Or is it a window? Or what is it? So you get in the background again a repressive modality, whereas the apparent subject of the picture is really the interior tension between the two women sitting at the feet of Jesus, which is more important, doing the housework and preparing dinner, or listening to the teacher uh, teach. That's, of course, the passage in the Gospel. So the Lascaris puts that in this, uh, 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 in this um, uh, picture uh, or window, as, uh, this kind of background motif is a perfect uh, plastic expression of the repressive mode in the structure of authority. Let's go on to the next and hurry along. Vermeer in the Metropolitan Museum in New York, a uh, woman asleep at a table. I'm sorry if my slide is a very poor one. Uh, uh, I, I made it from the photographs that the Metropolitan sent me. It was clear that they were out to frustrate me. In back of, of her is a picture that she is dreaming, and it's clearly a picture of incest. And so the real theme of what is going on in that picture of sleep, simply woman asleep, is here. And it's a transgressive motif. But that transgressive motif is unknown even to the sitter, because she's dreaming. And in the repression, of course, in repressive mode, she will, as all cultures must induce us to do, forget what we are dreaming which creates a tremendous tension in the whole Freudian theory of therapy of recovering what we dream. Because in the very deep wisdom of, a, of many predecessors of Freud, it's best not to know. That's a point of separation between Freud and Nietzsche, for example, on this matter. Nietzsche is a great admirer of the art of forgetting. Uh, let's go on to the next. 
Oh, it's upside. It's, uh, we, I've got it in wrong. This is Turner's Great Color and Light, Jesus Theory in the, in the tape. And, and uh, um, it's based upon Turner's reading of the first English translation of the Farbenlehre, in which, um, in which, uh, Goethe says, every color has a meaning. He's writing against Newton, who wants to reduce all color in the color spectrum to material gradations, to physical explanations. And, and Goethe says, no, in the Farbenlehre, this is all wrong. And Turner, in this picture, called Color and Light, takes up the cudgels for Goethe's theory, because for him, reality is a divine veil of color and light. You must read Turner's great poem, uh, pretty poor poetry, but very important if you're going to understand Turner, called Fallacies of Hope. Um, you, know, you remember the great passage in either or in the rotation method of Kierkegaard where he says to be an artist in life is to achieve a condition of hopelessness unless you can abandon hope you will not live in um, uh, live a true life um, a very great passage indeed and entirely at odds with the modern remissive uh, temper. Let's go on to the next. Sorry, that, that picture was wrong. This is a superb picture by the American artist James, Mer uh, 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 James Merritt uh, Chase. Sorry, William Merritt Chase, turn of the century figure, a great teacher in New York. It is called um, a polite visit, or words to that effect, a tete a tete. Uh, it is, in fact, a picture which has great recessions that owe a great deal to Velasquez. If one looks at this picture closely, at the thrust of that hand, at the thrust of that head, at her defensive posture, these are two women locked in a Jamesian erotic struggle that is controlled only by the politesse of repression. They are at each other, but at each other in a way that John Carroll calls civilized guilt. Um, and of course, this modality of decorum is a key, for example, to the, uh, to the genius of Jane Austen. Jane Austen writes about a miserably vulgar society, a society of greed, a society of pompous pastoral asses like Mr. Collins in Pride and Prejudice, but in the face of such grossness, of such crudities as her mother herself expresses, as so many express, it is clear that Elizabeth, um, who is not temperamentally addicted to finding the good in all, but a fine, critical perceiver of things, knows that one must maintain decorum. One must maintain politesse. And of course, at a certain point, when she attacks her husband-to-be, she's attacking him in a way for which she later is ashamed, deeply ashamed, because she has not perceived the, the hidden virtue of Mr. Darcy. You may remember that's a key to the, to the entire structure of, of that culture. She does not understand the sources of Mr. Darcy's authority, even though she has a very clear and deep vision of these uh, concealments and distortions of which Mr. Collins is the most wonderfully grotesque example, because everything he says is a negation of what any uh, pastor should say and feel. That's quite obvious. He has no charity, has no virtue. Um, he is, in fact, an arrogant fraud. Um, and it's the, in America, they usually nowadays become chairman of sociology departments, in my experience, at least. I think of myself as a perfect Mr. Collins. Uh, let's go on to the next. This is a 
a picture called Charity. It's a great uh, motif in, of a nurturing mother or woman uh, feeding a, a satisfied babe. And uh, it's a perfectly straightforward representation of charity. You expose the breast. In fact, the, the child is turning away. You can see the milk dripping down his chin. This is in the Metropolitan New York. It's by Dandini, a fine second-rate Italian painter uh, whom I tried to buy once at Christie's and I only lost by 41,000 guineas. Uh, uh, I bid up to 3,000 for it. Uh, now let's, let's go on to the next one, which is a superb representation of charity in the remissive mode. This is uh, by Bellucci, uh, again, a 17th century Italian artist. Uh, uh, many of these were done. It's called Roman Charity. I won't stop to describe the legend. I must stop shortly, in fact, to allow you to devastate this lecture in a totally transgressive way. Uh, the, uh, uh, notice that the daughter is feeding the father who's starving. You understand that uh, a remissive act is given is 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 is, is, is enactable for an excusing reason. She is visiting the father who is doomed to be executed in prison with her own child, and he's starving, and she's not allowed to bring anything else. So she gives her father her breast. Uh, a very great legend. Uh, it was done over and over again. It appealed greatly to the buyers of art in a European society for obvious reasons. You see how the repressive mode works. Uh, but it is a legitimate reason. You will let your father starve. But um, in Greek thought, you'll find this in Plato, in fact, you find it repeatedly from Plato to Matthew Arnold explicitly under the Greek doctrine of epikaia, an excusing reason for doing what is otherwise not to be done, an extraordinary circumstance allowing you to do that. The, what happened is that increasingly, uh, in Plato, by the way, when I teach the laws and I've written on the laws, um, Plato uh, 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 makes asservation after asservation on the limits of remissiveness. And the laws is a tremendous defense, as the Republic is, as the Philebus is, of the supremacy of the interdictory motifs. The theory of forms is a theory of sacred order with the interdictory motifs firmly in place forever. Um, that's the key to Plato that Popper doesn't understand when he associates him with authoritarians, with totalitarians, in fact. Uh, Professor Popper simply hasn't read Plato as I think he should be read. Um, in, however, in Plato, there is certainly the doctrine of Epikaia. For example, the most famous doctrine of Epikaia in Plato, the excuse and reason, is in the Republic. It's the doctrine of the noble lie. You never remember. Um, that tradition continues in the history of Western theory, on which I have a chapter. It's called Excuses, Excuses, which I think is a rather funny title. Um, at least in America, it seems a funny title. Um, and um, um, it goes up to Matthew Arnold, who you know was a little uneasy about his batting Hebraism over the head in culture and anarchy and celebrating Hellenism. And he wrote a palinode uh, uh, to that book um, later, you uh, may remember, very late in his career. And in the last chapter, he says Jesus, the secret of Jesus, um, is epikaia sweet reasonableness. If you look at Little and Scott, the standard Greek dictionary, you'll find epikaia meaning sweet reasonableness, excusing reason, and also equity, a fair play. 
uh, response to an extraordinary circumstance. So that Arnold, although thinking of himself as a conservative, in his career and in the last chapter he says Jesus the secret of Jesus um, is epikaya sweet reasonableness if you look at Little and Scott the standard Greek dictionary you'll find epikaya meaning sweet reasonableness excusing reason and also equity as fair play uh, response to an extraordinary circumstance so that Arnold, although thinking of himself as a conservative figure, actually turns the Son of God into a remissive figure. Fascinating passage in Arnold. Um, and that's the source of the true self-disease of Western liberalism, of liberal conservatism, or conservative liberalism, however you want to call it, since the Son of God becomes a remissive figure. Um, in Matthew Arnold. Uh, as the remissions expand, of course, what happens is that uh, we have movements that say, in effect, why not? Why shouldn't the daughter, in other than such extenuating and ex extraordinary circumstance, give the breath to her father? In fact, in America, there is definitely, as I predicted years ago, of course, I am a prophet, as you well know, uh, um, uh, there's a movement succeeding the movement uh, for abortion, which is the movement for incest, therapeutic incest. The movement's well underway. And it's coming from the top down, from the remissive elites in the university, from the semi-skilled intelligentsia in the social sciences largely, which ought to be abolished all over the Western world. I'm glad to hear that at Melbourne, they think they have no sociology department. But of course, these disciplines have, have uh, both psychology, Marxism, as we miss you, uh, as pseudosciences have penetrated so deeply into the popular um, um, uh, semi-skilled intelligentsia of that um, of other faculties are thoroughly, thoroughly um, psychologized and therapized. Let's go on to the next two. You have a perfect example there. Here is uh, the, rem the remissive motif carried to an extraordinary length. Uh, Professor Berger referred to this event. It's a, it's a march at Princeton University, quite distinguished little place near Philadelphia, um, um, to which F. Scott Fitzgerald went, I believe, uh, once Presbyterian. There is nothing <coughs> worth dying for. Uh, this chap with his mouth open comes from Scarsdale, one of the richest suburbs in America, um, and is typically a post-Jew. Um, his parents think the prophets were uh, probably uh, advisors to Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Um, but of course, what it must mean is clear. If there's nothing worth dying for, then the doctrine that there's nothing worth dying for is not worth dying for. And there you have the ass end of the, the uh, dialectic of a predominant remissive motif that I understand to be uh, characteristic of modernity. Let's go on to the next. This is a picture of shame. It is called Fatherly Advice by the great Dutch artist Terborsch. And, of course, uh, fatherly advice is uh, a concealment. The reading of this picture is clear. This is a procurus, that old bag there. He is the client. He has a coin in his hand. 
you have to read this picture in a certain perspective, and this is the prostitute who's being bought. And if you, can you switch back to the last uh, slide of the remissive motif of, no, one back, yet one more. That's it. You notice that although the daughter is doing something that is justified in the circumstance, she is looking away. She is ashamed. It is a sure sign of shame in dogs as in ourselves. It is an involuntary gesture, a necessary gesture of shame. That's, and, and to look things straight on when you're doing something that is not to be done but justifiably done as in a remissive, a truly subserving remissive act, you are still ashamed and you do not do it again at all. So this is also within, you see how the remissive act subserves the superordinate interdicts here. You don't give your breath to your father ordinarily. Uh, let's go on, past that execrable thing. She, is, uh, she has her neck exposed to you because she is ashamed. She's not looking at either of them. It's an image of shame. And Terbush knew what he was doing in his gut where knowledge belongs. Because it's just too treacherous. Knowledge between the ears is a whore. It can rationalize anything. That's what Weber means by rationalization. Let's go on to the next, and then I will must conclude very quickly. This is by John Byam Liston Shaw, a late Victorian, early Edwardian painter, and it's a passage from the Gospels. I won't go into it. This is a prostitute on the streets of London, and these two salvational ladies are offering her the flower, the white rose, which is an image of purity. And of course, she turns away. It's an image of shame. The question is, in the presence of what object, under what circumstances, do you actually, in your body motion, express shame? Uh, let's go on to the next. This is an image of shame in sacred order, which then becomes guilt psychologically. The predicate I suggest to you, as in the work from which this lecture comes, of a shame in sacred order is guilt in the intrapsychic structure. One absolutely uh, certain image of shame guilt, and Professor is uh, Heller is quite right in refusing a clear-cut distinction, ex uh, except I would like to say that there is a distinction, a very important one. The predicate of psychological guilt is sacred shame. There must be this structure of authority and which puzzles Freud deeply because one of his great problems never resolved by Freud because he was a great negational theorist the greatest negational mind of the, of the century, um, which is closing, I hope and think. Um, um, Freud knew that guilt precedes action. That is, guilt precedes a transgressive action. How can that be? And why? Because he could admit, admit no sacred order, no structure of authority. So it was a great puzzlement to him. And so he, his solution is a very simple one, and has come to dominate our language and even dominates part of Professor Carroll's presentation. Uh, uh, that is, he turns the parent question of humanity, art thou my master or am I thine, into the question of parents, father images, mother images, and so forth. But that question is subject to infinite regress, as he himself recognized in that monumental work on historical truth, Moses and Monotheism, which is a book about an introductory elite that takes millennia
to establish what he calls the Jewish character, in which the structure of authority remains stable, literally, until Freud murders the teacher of that structure in Moses and monotheism, because Freud is the true murderer of Moses. Uh, and by the way, an interesting element in this, you'll find it in the third edition of The Mind of the Moralist, when Freud has his great dreams about the death of his father, before he goes to see the body, 1896, it's in the interpretation of dreams, and in his letters to Fleiss, uh, to Fleiss he, he has a dream of going to a barber shop and there's a big placard in the barber shop which says, um, close one eye or alternatively close both eyes. And he has great trouble, uh, he makes a mess of the interpretation of that dream. But it's, it is a deep guilt dream, of course, as typical of guilt to be one-eyed. There's a famous old Hasidic joke that you probably all know, and so I'll tell it very swiftly, of the, of the Hasid and his son who go to Paris, and the, young, uh, the adolescent ogles all these magnificent creatures strolling along the Champs-Élysées, and the father says, God will strike you blind, and the son immediately says, I'll risk one eye. <laughs> um, uh, that's no joke. It is an expression of guilt in which you both um, accept the punishment of guilt, which is a punishment, it is the archetypal punishment, and do what is not to be done at the same time. So it's the in introductory remissive motif literally on the body. I want to show you a sequence of one-eyed images of guilt. Uh, let's go. This, of course, is from the Sistine Chapel. Uh, this is Matisse a whole series in the Museum of Modern Art that Matisse clearly doesn't understand, nor is there any reference in the crit critical literature, uh, and I've asked a number of Matisse scholars like Lawrence Going, why one eye is literally blind in the series called Jeanette. They're guilt, they're guilt faces, and it's the unconscious dynamic of, the, of Matisse's art here, that this Jeanette is guilty. What she's guilty of, Matisse doesn't know and we don't know, but it is a head that is characteristically seeing itself guiltily with one eye, and you see it that way. Uh, the standard way of reading this is that it's formally necessary for it to be one-eyed. Let's look at the next Jeanette in the series. Horrific. Why? This is again a Jeanette head, one-eyed. Why? Let's go on to the next. Jeanette, one eye. That eye is blind. Let's go on to the next. Matisse has no idea. Now, this is Egon Schiele, a great figure of the Viennese Decadence, 1910, and it is called the Prophet. One-eyed prophet, what's that? Two-eyed or no-eyed? Shiro was a remarkable uh, artist of the structure of authority, an artist of remarkable capacity to express his own tormented unconscious. And uh, there, um, 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 I want to show you a number of other Shiro images of guilt, one-eyedness. Let's go on to the next. There you have again, these are called, this is a whole series that Sheila did before the First World War in Vienna, uh, called Self-Seers, or Seers, S-W-E-R-S. -E and again, it's an image of guilt, unmistakably, as unmistakable as the Freudian image of guilt or the, or the, or the image of guilt I showed you on the Sistine Chapel, which is called but was recalled by Michelangelo, shamefacedness. Let's go on to the next. This is, this is Caspar David Friedrich, 
a very great painter of the late 18th, early 19th century. This is 1803. It is a self-portrait of Friedrich. One-eyed. Why? Why paint himself one-eyed? Well, if you look at Fried the rest of Friedrich's work, you will see why. And let's go on to the next. That's a figure by Turner called Lady in a Van Dyke Costume. But the, if I have looked at that picture many times in England, and the eyes are dead. The life is in the eyes. And it's not a very good slide, I must confess. I had to have it made. It is such an unpopular picture, people think it's ugly. Life is in the eye. When Buddhists make statues, there is a ritual, an elaborate series of interdicts about doing the eyes. Um, an elaborate series of taboos. It reminds me of that great moment of a very great actor, the greatest before Paul Schofield in the English-speaking world, at least, Laurence Olivier in the film version of The Entertainer. Do you remember that? When he, there's a close-up of him, and he's talking to the woman, and he says uh, to her, you know, he's this lively song and dance man, but he, he says to her, and the camera focuses on him, and Olivier has a magical capacity to do things to himself, a true magician, and he says, oh, look into my eyes. They're dead. They're dead, you see. Memorable moment. Best lines John Osborne ever wrote. Magnificent. He's already in the second death. And this is a picture of the second death as well. Let's go on to the next. This is Jasper John's famous uh, um, uh, uh, target with four faces. But of course, those faces are like skulls. They're eyeless. They are, those faces are objects. They are no longer what we would call spiritual entities. They're not heads. It's a magnificent moment of the imagination. Just a moment longer, and we'll stop. Um, next, uh, then, is this superb, powerful, and horrible nude in the Philadelphia Museum by Thomas Aikens, the greatest of American painters. It's a nude, but she is masked. She is a body. She is regnant, transgressive sexuality. She is a prostitute. She is an engine of sexuality. She is shameless. She sees nothing, I suggest. Now, if you ask me, did Aikens really think that when he did it? It doesn't matter. The unconscious is not, does not operate that way. Culture does not operate that way, except when, in a particular culture, its consciousness is at the insolent end of its tether and thinks it knows what it ought not to know. Let's go on to the next. There is one on which I want to stop. This is Palmer's self-portrait as a youth in the Ashmolean in Oxford. Let's go on. Van Eyck, the holy face, which Palmer saw. Let's go on. Palmer painting himself as a saint, if not God, in old age. Let's go on. This is Sheila giving himself the Hebrew sign of the blessing. But of course, uh, a teaching elite, the rabbinate and the priesthood never gave themselves a blessing. It was given to those they guided. There's a perfect example of a remissive motif. Let's go on to the next. This is, this is uh, Gauguin's marvelous uh, self-portrait as demonic saint. Total tension of uh, 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 total ambivalences. You see the serpent. You see the halo. You see the demonic face of of Gauguin himself, um, who was certainly left Western culture in order to seek, mm -hmm. as as Professor Blaney uh, put it very well, for a paradise that is a world without a structure of authority or uh, without necessary obediences. Let's go on to the next. Uh, there, I want to stop very soon. This is 
a, um, um, a glass in, you just see a viewer here, I took the slide, uh, there was no way, I wanted in fact someone behind it. This is Duchamp doing a work of art that is deliberately made to be seen through. Because Duchamp's whole ambition was to produce a work of art that was not a work of art. That is, a work of art that was not a response to sacred order, that admitted no source of authority other than itself. Our condition is so horrible that we are now in a situation, we've heard any number of such um, performances here during the symposium, in which we are producing symbols that really are self-consciously produced to refer to themselves. And Duchamp was a great master of this, in which the symbol doesn't point to a something truly beyond itself, but to something that is inseparable from the symbol. So reality becomes a heuristic device. This is magnificently done in Antonioni's blow-up. You remember the scene in which uh, the model with whom he's done this orgiastic similitude of, of uh, sexual intercourse at the beginning of the film. He meets her at a pot party, and he says, I thought you were in Paris. And she says, I am in Paris. Uh, in London, of course, at a swank pot party. That's all there is of the sociology of knowledge, except it's wrong. Peter Berger is wrong. She is not describing reality. She is not in Paris. And when the photographer who spends his entire life constructing reality, knowing they're false, finally discovers a reality he has not constructed, he has to read it in blow up after blow up after blow up after blow up. And what does it turn out to be in that great film that no critic has rightly reviewed? Do you remember any of you have seen the film? Turns out to be death. But when he reads it through his camera, so distorted that only he knows it's death. But he never recovers from that experience of what Otho and others call the numinal. And in the last scene, remember in the mime tennis game when he picks up the ball, Antonioni does that beautiful, beautifully, because the Bacchus figure in that is just playing along. It's quite clear that he will never believe that the human will and mind really does construct reality that is a deeply subversive, remissive motif that has become transgressive. And you heard an innocent, elegant version of that a couple of nights ago. Let's go on to the next, and I will stop. This is a, a, the greatest thing and the most terrible thing in the Philadelphia Museum and the, and the supreme work of art of the Western tradition of denying or negating the structure of authority that is culture. If you walk into this bare room, it's called, it's by Duchamp, as you may know. It was his death work. He worked on it secretly for 14 years. And you walk up to it, as I've had, I taught a faculty seminar of 12 students, uh, uh, and I have 12 colleagues at least, and I took them to see this since I was doing the book from which this lecture comes. There are two peoples here. And you walk up to it, and then you look in, and the distinguished uh, professor of philosophy and chairman of his department, who was uh, taking this course with me, literally looked in and staggered back and said, appropriately enough, oh my God. And I've had uh, illegal slides made as best I can by a devoted student of what's behind that door. And I'll try to show you. This is Duchamp's supreme effort to do a work of art that does not respond to anything about except itself. It is a complete construct. Now, what is behind it? Let's go on to the next. This is behind it. A mutilated female body with a sex symbol, uh, that is the lamp, is obviously phallic, um, in, a, in, a, in a landscape. 
It's not a painting, it's a construct. And that's what you see through there. And you ask, who is it, what is it? The supreme work of art becomes a violation, an obvious, gross, crude violation, with the clitoris showing as horrible. And yet it is shown in a museum as a supreme work of all art called Eton Donné, being given. That's all there is to reality, nothing more to being. And now we come full circle to Hamlet because the real question is finally still for sociology, uh, for Freud, for everyone, is there a being beyond our will and mind or not? The greatest theorists, theorists the greatest visionaries of this in modernity have all said not, but always negationally, as Duchamp did. Let's have the next uh, furtive, criminally taken slide of this image. This is the uh, genitalia of this horrible, horrible masterpiece that is, in fact, the key work in one of the great museums in the world, to which <coughs> thousands <coughs> pay reverential visits to peek in. I think it describes the condition of a remissive culture run brilliantly amok. At this point, I think I'd better stop before you stop me. Thank you.